uh, ladies and gentlemen, Honorable Iran Vikram Ratna is an economist by training and holds a degree in economics and politics. And, uh, and he holds an MSc in economics from University of London. A banker by profession, Iran has served as the vice president of Citibank and he's the chief executive, former chief executive officer and director of the National Development Bank. Honorable Vikram Ratna, over to you. Thank you. I want to thank Advocata for inviting me to be here this morning. Um, and uh, I read with interest what uh, Advocata is doing and also about the Fraser Institute and its work, and particularly work relating to economic freedom. I'm going to make some general comments and maybe also quickly take up some of the issues that Anushka raised so that we could think about it a little bit more deeply, uh, I guess as your day progresses. As you know, in Sri Lanka, our issue is that the government's stake in the economy is very big. It's much bigger than we think. Uh, just to illustrate it, the advocates of right to information, and me being one, and very vociferously talking about it while in opposition, and uh, supporting the present speaker, even when he brought a private member's bill to parliament to get the right to information, now sitting on the other side and trying to implement the right to information, uh, uh, still strongly believes in the principle of the right to information, but I also realize some of the practical issues that have arisen. For example, I was having a discussion with some friends the other day, and uh, I was telling them, you know, you don't realize when you ask some information that I'd rather not give it to you because it is commercially sensitive information, unlike in other countries which you are monitoring, in Sri Lanka, the state is so big in the economy that if I give you that information, it will affect the state institution's competitiveness vis-a-vis -vis those in the private sector who are competing. Now, something that really we had never really thought about. So we have a state which has commercial entities, maybe about 250 commercial entities in the economy. So our fiscal dynamics don't really support this as we move more and more towards eliminating or minimizing the fiscal deficit. So the government is trying to create an environment in which, because of its low savings in the economy, of inviting investment and also foreign investment, looking at ways and means in which sharing the risk and also having structures like the PPP structures and models to optimize the return on state assets. Unfortunately, uh, a few years ago, we had this situation where there was enabling legislation to expropriate some assets. I must say that this was a very negative signal and detrimental to the economy. The govern present government does not agree with what happened and steps will be taken to repeal such legislation. On the area of property rights and even private property rights, I would say uh, that these must be exercised particularly with responsibility to the environment and to negative externalities and pollution and so forth. I also happen to be the United National Party organizer for an electorate south of Colombo. And one of the frequent complaints I have, and I probably received that complaint this morning because I chaired the District Development Council at 10 o'clock this morning in the south of Colombo, is that private companies are polluting the Bolgoda, the Kaluganga, and all the waterways around there. So I think we have lots of issues regarding right, the security of property rights, and we want to basically secure property rights, but secure property rights 
in a responsible way. In terms of monetary policy, our government has upheld the principle that the central bank must have its independence and act independently. And we have recently made sure that the central bank has that right. I recently was in a pre-budget discussion and uh, some of the younger, if I can call them, business uh, entrepreneurs, one of the things they told me was the central bank has made some comment about real estate and that it is dampening the real estate market. I quickly leaped to the central bank's defense and what I said was that the central bank had every right to make that statement independently of the government because we don't certainly want to have a post-Asian, uh, uh, you know, what happened in Malaysia and Singapore situation where the central bank was subsequently accused of really not acting in time. So we have a central bank which is free to act independently. Exports have come down, as you all know, drastically as a percentage of GDP over the last 15 years. Our government's twin strategy is while attracting foreign investment, is also to encourage trade and particularly exports. A national export strategy has been formulated and much work has been done and we are certainly looking at implementing some of those suggestions. In terms of revenue that comes to government, most of our revenues are collected at the border. Whether it is the taxes on duty or other taxes in terms of efficiency of collection are collected at the border. So more than 50% of our revenue is collected at the border. About 80% of all our revenue comes through three state institutions. It is the Customs, the Excise Department, and the Inland Revenue Department. So we must liberalize trade, but we'll have to do this in a measured way. We must bring in anti-dumping laws to ensure fair trade practices. We will have to have a trade adjustment package as we adjust, particularly while these domestic industries and entities will get hurt, some of which will get hurt, in our move to liberalize further. We are under no illusion, and I think in Anushka's remarks this morning, he made it clear too about the imperfections of the market ranging from information asymmetry, weaknesses in competition, and also externalities. But we want to have regulation, but hopefully smart and ob unobtrusive leg legislation. Institutional reform and a change in the mindset. I would like to conclude my brief remarks by actually taking a few issues that were raised and also to show the complexity when we deal with these issues. For example, Anushka said that in a recent exchange at the Ministry of Finance, the industry pointed out that there was a lack of skills in certain areas, and if they were to try to get those skills from overseas, the immigration department would refer that to a line ministry. And then it will be months before a response would come. And once the response comes and the process is completed, you may or may not have the requirement for the skill that you were actually seeking. So that was a very practical uh, problem. And I asked them then and there, what do you think is the solution? And they immediately suggested a solution. They said, can't you give the discretion for the control of immigration and immigration to make that decision. Uh, this was just about two weeks ago. I, I uh, had a discussion with the control of immigration and immigration, and I told him that he will be soon getting the power to make that decision. 
Yesterday, I followed it up, and it might require a cabinet approval. And the suggestion that came from the industry was very simple. Just annually decide what are the skill sets you need, give him a list of the skill sets, and then let him make the decision on the spot. Review the list from time to time, depending on the needs of the economy. Now, the reason I highlighted that was, as Anushka said, our issue often is not very large disagreements on what needs to be done, but it's actually an inability to implement. I think if I were to pick one thing as a priority that needs to be done, it is to focus on implementation. Lots often I get phone calls, not often, every day, almost every hour, saying that, can we have a meeting? Can we discuss something? And I've got to the point that I just don't have time in the calendar to have meetings. This is my first meeting today at 8.30 in the morning, and my final meeting concludes at 12.30 tonight. And therefore, we all need to do some sleeping. So I tell people, please send us a note, just very short note with what the problem is, but also please include in your note what you think the solution is going to be. Because if I could just pick it out and send it to the relevant point of implementation, that will greatly help them and assist them, and then we can monitor or get some feedback as to why it can or can't be actually done. So implementation is actually the key. So we are open. Send us a note. Remember that change does not always come from the top. Change often comes from the bottom, because that's where people are under pressure to change. He also referred to the three-wheelers, and I really like that, because there is this very middle-class idea that, my heavens, this is a menace. You know, can we in some way limit it or get rid of it? Three-wheelers are here to stay. They are a very important part of our economy. They're a very important, important part of our community. But we all understand that they need to be regulated in some way because of the undesirable aspects of that industry true. We are doing it in an interesting way. If a man falls from a coconut tree and is injured, the three-wheeler was his ambulance. If there is a road accident, the three-wheeler was the ambulance. Until very recently, in the districts of Hambantota, Matara, Gaul, Colombo, Gampaha, and Kalutara, until very recently, there was no ambulance service where anybody could call. Unless you had private insurance and called your private hospital, there's virtually no ambulance. Today, we have a very modern ambulance service operating in all these cities. 93% of all telephone calls are answered within the first minute. And I have had personal experience while addressing a meeting like this, where somebody suddenly fell ill. And I timed it. It just took eight minutes for the ambulance to get that person off the premises on the road to a hospital. We are rolling this out countrywide. It was a three-wheeler that was that ambulance. He talked about the three-wheeler being the last mile connectivity. And I agree with it. I think it will always be the last mile connectivity. But the problem today is that it is not the last mile. It is the long mile. That's a problem we are facing. And that needs a change in government policy from getting off highways into public transport. Who drives on a highway? It is the politician that Anushka referred to in his very expensive car. Or it is maybe some of you who drive on the highway. I've asked audiences where I have gone, how many have actually driven on the highway, in the southern highway? And sometimes I get only two or three hands in an audience of 100 people. That's the economic benefit that people have actually received in terms of transport. Of course, there are other benefits that come from a highway in terms of industry uh, uh, and, and the economy. So we, we need to improve our public transport. And this is something that we need to persuade government to do. 
We have a lack of capital in the system. Small savings, lack of capital. Often wondering how this could actually be handled. So government comes with all kinds of schemes and some of them were elaborated on. But how do we actually overcome this problem? We are, if I could generalize, and these generalizations I know it's always dangerous, we are somewhat risk averse. China is China, but China certainly doesn't have a risk averse entrepreneurial culture. We are somewhat risk averse, whether it's the micro financing industry, they went with all good intentions to the north and the east, and today the crap that they have to hear about their microfinance loans. I can understand both, both sides of the argument. On one side, that's all they have. What they have is loan money and not capital. On the other hand, people there took the loans, what they actually needed was some equity in their businesses, even if they were women-headed households. But there was a lack of equity. And we've got into a bind where loans have turned into equity without really intending them to turn into equity. The same is happening in small industries because of a lack of capital. He referred to Sri Lankan Airlines on the, in, in, in the few comments he made on state-owned enterprises. Clearly there is a problem on Sri Lankan Airlines. I would like to ask the question, what should we do with it? What should we do with it? It doesn't matter who is in, who is in charge. It doesn't matter what the management team is. Fundamentally, is there a proposition for Sri Lankan Airlines? Is there a business and economic proposition for Sri Lankan Airlines in the current economic context of the airline industry? My own personal view is there isn't an economic and financial proposition. We need to be honest with ourselves. We need to then ask the question, how much are we, we willing to pay if it brings some kind of national pride to fly the flag in the air? That's a question that we need to ask ourselves. That's a political question. That's not an economic and financial question. A political question needs a political answer. And sometimes we have to make political decisions. But I would like to say this also about Sri Lankan Airlines. Sri Lankan Airlines was sold eight A350 350, 900, <coughs> A350-900 aircrafts, long-flying, broad-bodied aircrafts, which didn't fit its strategy. I think the sellers also have a responsibility. Yabas Industries in France also has a responsibility. They should have taken note whether a small country like ours, with a small GDP, a small airline, competing internationally, should have actually been sold these aircrafts. Sellers and buyers both have responsibilities in an economy. And that is unfortunate that we have had to already pay nearly $100 million in basically terminating four aircrafts, still four aircrafts on our books today. I would want not take more time responding to some of the issues that came out of Anushka's speech. But I would like to finally say this. I think your conference is a very important conference. I'm particularly glad about the discussion shop topics that you have chosen. Exchange control liberalization, property rights, improving the bureaucracy, free movement of people, and then labor market reforms. Certainly, I would look forward to the deliberations and the conclusions that you reach. But please, send us a note on implementation and not a report. Thank you.